I'm going to talk pretty quickly, pretty fast, but the, what I want to do is help give you, based on our data, um, the landscape of what corporate America looks like in recruiting, um, the recruiting platform, talk about what some of the challenges are, and um, hopefully give you some insights on best practices. So with that, so pretty much the undercover confessions that I hear about a lot are Despite our brand and influence in the marketplace, we are challenged in consistently recruiting top diverse talent into our organization. Despite our long standing diversity programs and initiatives, we are challenged in regaining and retaining, engaging and retaining the diverse talent in our organization that we can't attract it fast enough. Despite our commitment to diversity initiatives, we are challenged in, in demonstrating specific measurable linkages between those efforts and, and performance in the marketplace. So I'm here to offer you some, redem some redemption. With thinking about sourcing as using principle-driven approaches around recruitment that lead to your right diversity recruiting strategies, aligning target recruiting strategies with great outcomes, system systemic rigor and independent assessment in auditing diversity processes to key effectiveness and impact. So I hope that we're able to provide this to you. Okay, so let's see. All right, in the, just moving fast through the executive summary, basically on average we have about 600 Fortune 500 companies that register for our survey. 70% of those complete the survey, uh, about uh, 70, which is about 300 companies per complete the survey. They have the ability to do it for our rankings. And so each year, our average company size is 30,000. Uh, 30, our average regional size of employees is about uh, 6,000 employees. So that's the, the source of the data. So every year we do the current, um, we have the current trend analysis that we're able to do. We partner with Nielsen for the purpose of understanding the population insights and what's happening. And believe it or not, it's really important to understand what's going on in the population. And even though Nielsen is the largest consumer-based index, it speaks to behavior, right? So with all this unconscious bias and trying to understand what people are doing, uh, within their own mindset in the workplace, you need to understand their behaviors and really linking consumer spending and behavior to what's going on with the change in population and demographic trends is pretty, it's pretty great. Because when you look at how millennials, for example, perform and what they do, you know, 80% of them use technology to make decisions and do what, you know, so it's not a bad thing, it's a great thing. However, that's how they buy, that's how they live too. 80% of their decisions are made online. So Nielsen is letting us know, if you look at the trends here, that it's not, it's not long before the majority of the population is going to be diverse. So it's important, it's a competitive advantage which is a winning strategy in terms of why companies should uh, uh, diversify their, their organization. In fact, 92% of the total growth, I think I have it here, in the United States population from 2000 to 2014 would come from multicultural consumers. What's important to know here, here's the business case. This multicultural population is transforming the mainstream with 3.4 billion combined buying power. So the good news is, one, African Americans are still spending, they're about 1.1 trillion. Hispanics are catching up. That's a projected number, they haven't done it yet, but they're getting there. So be careful when you're doing your planning about the consumptions with what's happening with the Latino population. And then where you have Asians who are the most sophisticated and savvy consumer, they are spending more specifically and they have the higher income to do so. But the, the, the unique group that's really like our hidden um, identity group that is a major marketplace opportunity is the LGBTQ community. So comp Nielsen basically is saying if you want to look at an organization in terms of what to do in some new marketing, Go to your LGBTQ group. Now here, uh, Diversity MBA is among some of the other strategic benchmarking. Companies typically only benchmark with us because they're strategic about what they do. So some of the results that I want to give you nuggets on in terms of some of the best practices and what companies are doing. I'll share with you some of the best practice companies while, um, so you know who, who they are. But understand this, the best in class companies are only 40% 
at the top of the journey. So the GEs of the world, the AT&Ts of the world, they still have a long, long way to go because you're talking about hundreds of thousands of employees. So at the end of the day, it's about what you do with the individual, it's about how you connect with the relationship, and it's about what's happening in talent acquisition to broaden their lens to make sure they're the connectors in the organization. So what Diversity MBA decided to do, we said, okay, organizations, you're having this hard time on recruiting, you're talking about the war on talent, you can't bring them in. Well, we said, well, let's look and see who's recruiting. Like they say, who's Zoom and who? Let's look and see what's happening there and look at yourselves first. Let's look in the mirror first and see what's going on. So when you look at what's happening strategically, all the different strategies that exist in the organization, recruiting and talent acquisition strategies need to line with diversity strategies. But the, 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 the best in class companies, including Pepsi, in fact, they interviewed Indra last year, they, they made diversity and inclusion a pillar in their organization, a strategic pillar. And then so, um, in fact, I just came out of a coaching session and a business unit leader moved into DNI and said, you know, I was trying to change the DNI and I couldn't figure out how to measure it. And I'm like, why not? You were the sales leader of the organization. You were driving productivity. You were driving uh, outcomes around revenue. Why can't you do that in, in recruiting? Why can't you do that? Because guess what, folks? Without the people, there's no money. And how do you align strategy at the end of the day and make it actionable? You better make sure it's in the goals. You better make sure it's in the performance management. You better make sure they have that goal that you have. That's the only way it's going to get done, right? So that's the, that's the big piece there. And that's, a, and, that's, and that's a trend, that's a new trend. So when people talk about aligning um, diversity strategy and recruiting strategy and talent acquisition to the business unit, they really aren't. Because if it's not in your goals and if the accountability doesn't align with your accountability and if the compensation recognition doesn't, right, if it's not in the performance management, then it's, it's, it's not there, it's not real. So it's only real when accountability is aligned with it. So we want to ask, so we ask the companies, okay, who's sourcing the talent? Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, where you have non-Hispanic white females that are bringing in everybody, and if you don't have a mix, and, if those, and it's not a bad thing to have white females hiring, but if they don't have a competency lens and a bias lens and being able to look beyond themselves, they need to do that. But I decided there's a best-in-class model, and that is to have a balanced workforce, to have your recruiting team look like your consumer team that you're driving to, have the representation, the same representation on the folks that you want to go out that you can't hire that won't come because they don't look like them. So, 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 you know, come on, help me with that. So diversify the recruitment team, and then while it takes time to do that, educate them anyway. So, yeah, so I think there's a best-in-class model, not here yet, but diversify the ethnicity which, uh, among the team. I think that's important. The other thing that's important when you look at the data is uh, generational. My goodness, bring in the millennials to recruit the top talent. They're AT&T, they're upset because they got to compete against Apple and Google and the most great innovation. But when you look at it, all the big companies have these great technology, right? Departments that's going on. You're all doing cutting edge things. I was talking to Sears. They're doing cutting edge things. Of course they are. They're multi-billion organizations. But who's recruiting? Who's on the front line bringing in that talent, right? So I think, again, you need to have, this is, this, there's no best practices yet because we just started asking for this data the last few years. So we're asking the companies, what are you doing? But what I can tell you, the companies that have generationally and ethnically and by gender diversified their mix, including identity, LGBT, veterans, and persons with disabilities, within their recruiting force has, has done a great job. They're seeing the differences with that. But in the meantime, they're equipping their recruiters to make sure their recruiters have a, a broadened lens, to make sure their recruiters, regardless of their ethnicity, that's where you bring in those business partners. That's where you bring in those business leaders or those individual contributors that are being phenomenal and that are champions in the organizations. That's where you use your ERGs to show folks that you're on the journey and where you are on the journey. That's what it's about. This is the face. The recruiters are the face of the organization. They're the ones filling through what's going on. And it's way beyond that. One of the uh, things that we're seeing, comparing to 2014 outcomes, we do see a more balanced ethnic recruiting force 
with a significant shift from non-Hispanic white groups to leveling all other groups. So companies are getting it. Now what we did find is that Asians, for whatever reason, and Indians are not in the recruiting pipeline. I have no comments, no insights on that. They're just not there. That's all I can say about that one. So where's the gap? Here's a gap. So the training for recruiters, um, and this is very specific targeted diversity training, um, is a gap. Cultural competency, 74% look, looks high, but let me tell you, that's really a, uh, the multinationals are in that, and they're saying that's really global competency, that training. It's really not cultural competency for, your, for the recruiting force. You need to have that in there. They need to really understand domestically what that means, not just internationally. And then, they, so it's a different mindset when you want to bring your talent acquisition folks into the conversation what's happening. Those of you that are using LinkedIn and social media to source your talent to save a dime, it's going to cost you more. You're losing some of the best talent. Why? Because your algorithm does not match who that person is. So you are sourcing bias yourselves by using an algorithm, by catching so certain specific things that guess what? Some of the best talent, because they call me and they tell me they don't get it. I had personally the largest retailer in the world, I won't say any names, but personally the person, I said, oh here is, you said you needed a, a vice president with experience who came from another large retailer, the second largest, to help run your store, here's this person. I've got the person for you. So the field VP said, oh, Pam, thank you. Yes, my sister, a diverse person too. Okay, with all the skills we need, beautiful. Let me send them on up to the pipeline. Send them to the pipeline. And they got a letter that came back and said, oh, there's not a cultural fit. Are you kidding me? What the hell is wrong with you, recruiter that doesn't have a broadened lens, that can't see beyond the algorithm that says something? Who knows? I might just be too busy and didn't get it and lost a great talent. But that third largest retailer hired him. So you, you, you can't do that. It's got to go deeper. I know you don't have time. I know you, it's just another thing to do. But you have to go deeper in terms of what you're doing to broaden the lens. If you're not going to change it, you have to do that, OK? So targeted recruiting. OK, only thing I've got to say about this, and I get it, and I am talking to the association. I'm not going to National Black MBA Conference or NABA or NSBE, and I can't get the black folks. I'm not going to his Hase National uh, Nishimba, um, and, and SHIP if I can't get the Hispanic folks. I don't need to, so I'm going to go to the colleges and get what I need. So don't not go. You're down 42% in what you're doing. Tell them what you want. Use your resources to help the professional associations because guess what? I know they're the mechanism for recruitment for you. That's one of the places you go to get that talent year over year over year. And then if they're not giving you what you want, tell them what you need so that they can do that because they are the source for that diverse talent, whether you believe it, like it or not. Don't just stop going because they're caught up. Bring them back down. And then when you're, talk, when you're doing your college recruiting, guess what? HBCUs, the Hispanic colleges, the Asian can't get you everything you want. They can't. You've got to look at your campus recruiting strategy and go to some second tier three universities and ask for your top 10 or 15% diverse talent. Ask to look at students that you normally wouldn't. And if the, if the brand department, or they're only going to do the top 50 schools, let them do the top 50 schools. But you be innovative and go there and build that network that you have to. Because guys, it's on you. It is on you. If you're not finding it, it's on you. Okay, so work harder around, work differently. Work smarter. And, and it's OK. Because do you think Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and those guys are doing anything major different? They're not. It's just fun to be there. And so the word of mouth just given, they're only homogenous because dude is telling dude over here to come on and work over here because you got the credentials to do so. That's the only reason. It's an open leadership environment. It's a trusted environment. That's, that's all. And now they're like, oh, we need to diversify because we're, you know, 100 billion. Oh, yeah, okay, we got a responsibility to do that. So that's all it is. They're not doing anything wrong. It's just a great place to work and they know the talent they want to have. So that's the, that's the real difference around that there. Okay, so, okay, identity, close to my heart. 
Companies are doing a great job in identifying where they want to go source that talent. You're showing up at organizations, you know, out but equal, you know, the, the, the uh, war, Wounded Warriors, you're using all these resources online, offline to go recruit targeted identity, you know, folks, LGBT veterans and what have you. But then what happens? You're stuck with how do we onboard them? How do we help them understand that they can come into a trusted environment so that we can help identify? Corporate America basically is working in an unknown environment. You only know those by ethnicity because it's obvious. The two plus races, unless they choose to tell you, you don't know. And because there's a group of LGBT persons with disabilities that they're not going to tell you because they don't trust what's going to happen if they do. So you're never going to know. But within your opinion surveys, your engagement surveys, figure out an anonymous way to understand who's in your workforce and then, and then help them know through your messaging why you want to know they're, there, you're, they're in the workforce. You want to know they're there so they can have opportunity, so you can do what they, you know, so you can develop them, so you can educate the hiring manager to know that you're not going to, you know, have retaliation and these kinds of things within that. But that's the biggest, biggest issue. Uh, self-identity, identification within the cultures and what's happening with this group here. Uh, we have found that executive leaders that have on executive councils that have uh, come out and said, you know, I'm LGBT or person with disabilities that are recognizable, then those others are able to do that. But a great place to leverage how what's going on with this group is to use your BRGs, your ERGs, and speaking to the sensitivities so that they can help too. But knowing, but still, it's going to take a long time. Right now, 2%, less than 2% of LGBT are identified. Veterans are a big thing right now. So companies are doing a lot of work around that, and it feels fairly safe. But veterans with a disability is another issue. So those are some of the uh, trends that are happening right now. Not necessarily solutions. Well, one of the good solutions is um, companies are being able to establish uh, veteran mentoring programs. They haven't necessarily done that around persons with disabilities uh, yet, but they're definitely doing it with veterans. Okay. Uh, campus recruiting. The only thing um, I would tell you here when we look at uh, the best practices and the formulas, we've asked the companies, so you know, everything can be measured. And when you're measuring, it's one thing to do a metric. So we do our benchmarking survey, so we just don't ask about the processes and the methods and the systems that you have in place. So we want to know the metrics, then we need to know the outcomes and the impact. So if you're not tracking and doing all these things, then you don't know what your ROI is. So then when you go to this conference and you don't recruit anybody, you know, and they say, well, you didn't meet the ROI, well, did you even know? what you needed to look at. So activities are what? KPIs? Your activities are your key performance indicators. So if you're, at, you're on a campus and if you're sponsoring an event and you're spending, so know how many people are coming, how many touches you have, how many resumes you're getting, and converting all that. But the biggest thing that we know, the trend that's happening, companies that have formal internship programs are identifying functions where they're literally converting 80 plus percent of those students into hires. The other thing they're doing outside of going to the, so you have to tier your university executive group where the executives go speak because that's where they graduated from. Can't get away from that one. There's that group of universities. Then there's the universities that specifically you're going to because they're a true pipeline of the talent that you want. So you have those partnered universities. And then you just have all these other universities. Well, since you have them, look at them and talk to them about their top 10 or 15 percent diverse talent. That's the opportunity you can go on and leverage your executives to do other kinds of things. But also look at, just know what you're doing with these many, many universities. If you're not leveraging them, you don't need them. We really have got it down to a formula where companies really, really have to pay attention to what they're doing. The other thing that they're doing, even if they're overall campus recruiting, um, whatever that number is, because it ranges from five to from two to fifteen percent, on average, fifty percent of it is diverse hires. So that's pretty, that's the good news. And and I don't know if I'm going to call that a best practice. I would just say that's probably the need within the company, and that's a major sourcing for them. Um, so that's that's what I have to say about the campus recruiting piece there. How am I doing the time? I talked really fast, didn't I? Okay, on this page, I put the top 10 um, recruiting best practices. 
And with these, this is just a checklist for you guys. I'm not gonna go through all this, but this is a checklist. You can do an exercise, take them with your team and see where you align with them. And that will help you be able to say, okay, where can we validate that we're doing okay? In fact, if you, the reason I copied this presentation, and this is only part of our recruiting data, is to let you go back and ask yourself some questions. There's nothing like a self-audit. The harder you are on the audit, the better it is for your outcomes. People think to think they, are fe they fear audits, reward audits. The more you find, the better it is. And, and if you're a homogenous organization where people are comfortable with hiring folks like themselves, well, help them understand why that, why that happens. So what, what I was hoping to, uh, there's on the handout, I want to be able to go over um, a page for you. So the Skinny on Recruitment, the, cur the Current Best Practice Trends is a, a book that I'll be having out in the next uh, couple months. And it's the first of 25 uh, books that is a, uh, a series on all of our data. So this is a, a worksheet I thought I'd put together for you guys to be able to go back with a business lens. So there's a business lens in here. So on uh, potential power probes, these are conversations you can have with the hiring manager because the hiring manager has to believe that you understand the business well enough that you're gonna bring in the right candidate. And one of the best practices around that is companies have now aligned their diverse hiring slates with candidates with talent acquisition where it's, it's in their performance reviews and it's compensation based. AT&T, GE, some of the best and press companies are doing this, Kaiser Permanente. I'm finding out that it's more and more of best practices and that's driving some really systemic behavior but you want to be careful and make sure that people aren't doing it just to do it it's still about the best talent so here are some questions and things on here that um, that you're you know you're asking the, the business conversation you're having with the hiring manager so they know that is broader than just um, diversity and recruiting and then the other page I would refer you to some anecdotal stuff in here but to take yourself is, um, so when you're talking about, when you're taking ideas from people, I like my, um, and folks say, oh, this is, I can't get out of the box. I can't change this. The coin phrase to use is up till now. <laughs> up till now you couldn't, but now we can, because we're about innovation. We're about being different. So up till now, all day long, and they can't do anything about that one. But, um, and then um, on this last page here, it talks about procrastination is your foe, indecision is an assassination, so make every day count. So there's an exercise that you can take back and use for this entire conference. What are the five things I wanna go back and implement? But the biggest thing is really helping the folks on the front line the, the folks that are out there at the conference recruiting, no matter what your face looks like, that you represent all groups and you get it and I understand it and you can, you're, you're okay with having that bold conversation and you're also okay with sharing where your company is in the journey. And remember, it's a journey, it's a lifelong one. So celebrate the nuggets, you know how to do it. Go to marketing and say, look, you know, we just did that major commercial at the Super Bowl, that was awesome. Can we do something like that and celebrate some of this DNI stuff we've got going on the same way? Some of the recruiting hires, some of the stuff that we've done, you know how to do that. And so those are big, big, big things that make differences in the organization for trust.